Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Dursey Davis. I'm the executive director of the Ohio chapter of APA and vice chair of the New Urbanism Division, and I'm your webcast moderator. Today is Wednesday, October 21st, and we will hear the presentation, Public Involvement in Transportation Planning. For technical help during today's webcast, type your questions in the chat box found in the webcast toolbar to the right of your screen, or call the 1-800 number shown in bold. For content questions related to the presentation, type those in the questions box, also located in the webinar toolbar to the right of your screen. And please indicate which presenter you would like to answer your question. And we will answer all of those questions at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. On your screen is a list of the sponsoring chapters and divisions. Thanks to all of those participating sponsors for making these webcasts possible and free to members. Today's webcast is sponsored by the Transportation Planning Division. To learn more about all of our divisions, just visit planning.org slash divisions. And to learn about our chapters, planning.org slash chapters. Coming up on your screen is a list of our upcoming webcasts. To register for these webcasts, uh, just visit our webcast webpage at ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. And I will let you know October 30th uh, has not been entered yet, so it's it's not on our website yet. Uh, I was just given the information, so I wanted to include it today so that you knew there was a webcast coming up next week. Um, but I, I, I will get that posted onto our website shortly. Okay, to log your CM credits for attending today's webcast, uh, head to planning.org, log in, go to your dashboard, and select activities by provider. Again, today's provider is the Transportation Planning Division, and then you can select today's title. This webcast has been approved for 1.5 CM credits for live viewing only. Some of our recorded webcasts are available for distance education CM credit. For availability of our distance education credits, Again, check out our webcast webpage at ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. And like us on Facebook, Planning Webcast Series, to receive up-to-date information on our upcoming sessions. And we are recording today's webcast. It will be available on our YouTube channel. Uh, head to youtube.com slash planningwebcast or just search Planning Webcast in the YouTube search browser. Uh, and a PDF of the PowerPoint will be available after the presentation at ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. Okay, I'd now like to introduce today's speakers and get the show on the road. Our first speaker today is Alice Brown. Alice works at the Boston Transportation Department as the project manager for Go Boston 2030, the city's mobility action plan. Her recent projects include the Greenway Links Initiative with Livable Streets Alliance, public process for New York Rising at Sasaki Associates, and infrastructure network planning for the Boston Bikes Program. Our second speaker today is Mary Beth Eichert. Mary Beth is an accredited public relations practitioner with 15 years experience in service to government, nonprofit, and private sector organizations, primarily on issues-oriented communications and cause-related marketing. Her career has included communications work on behalf of an Indiana governor, early childhood literacy, human services for vulnerable populations, private sector health care, transportation and land use planning, tobacco prevention, and animal welfare. She was honored with the Nashville Area Chamber of Commerce's Emerging Leader Award in her industry sector and was designated by the Nashville Business Journal a both 2011 Woman of Influence and 2015 Top 40 Under 40. Our last speaker today is Kimberly Triplett. Kimberly is currently an assistant professor of urban studies at the Tennessee State University in the Department of Sociology, Social Work, and Urban Professions within the College of Public Services and Urban Affairs. Prior to this position, she was a program and policy analyst advanced for the Wisconsin Department of Transportation, WISDOT, and a lecturer. She currently teaches undergraduate courses in urban studies and nonprofit management and graduate courses in public administration with the College of Public Service and Urban Affairs at Tennessee State University. Her areas of research interests as 
her, I'm sorry, her areas of research interests are environmental justice, transportation equity, race and ethnicity, regionalism, social inequity, social justice, urban development, urban politics, historic development, and urban planning and policy. Dr. Triplett's primary research interests revolve around questions of equity and justice and transportation, mobility, and access planning, specifically with regard to transit agencies' approaches to include citizen participation and or civic engagement in the transportation decision-making process. Dr. Triplett has completed one research study funded by TDOT entitled Innovative Strategies for Public Involvement. The research study was collaborated among the TSU and University of Memphis. Okay, so with that, I am going to turn it over to our first speaker, Alice Brown. Alice. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, today I'm going to tell you about Go Boston 2030, which is a two-year transportation planning process that's about 13 months in. And I'll just jump right in to let you know that we're really excited that we recently released. Here we go. We recently released um, a vision framework that came out of a huge uh, undertaking of public engagement processes, trying to be really innovative and different and change up how planning is done in the city of Boston. And we began an entire process to get us to this vision framework with a simple question. What's your question about getting around Boston in the future? We actually began further back as part of a series of plans that are being undertaken concurrently within the city. Uh, we have a new mayor. He's been mayor for about two years now, and he has been really committed to thinking citywide about long-term strategic plans. So far, we've released a climate action plan, an open space plan, and a housing plan. We're also working on an arts and culture plan, integrating health into more policies, and Go Boston 2030 is a mobility piece. Um, you might also if you are familiar with Boston planning initiatives, have heard of Imagine Boston 2030, which is just launching now, that is trying to tie all of these initiatives together um, and also focus on things like land use, design, and equity. The mission of Go Boston 2030 from the outset has been to envision Boston's long-term transportation future through transformative policies and projects which are to come and an inclusive public engagement process that we are in the midst of. The core values of our plan have been equity, climate, and economy. It's really important to us that we not only level the playing field, but recognize that some people sort of start a few steps behind and that we're really trying to address inequities that are exist today. Um, the second issue is not just climate in general, but climate responsiveness. As a coastal city, we want to be sure not only that we are practicing sustainable transportation and supporting sustainable transportation modes, but that we're also ensuring that our systems are resilient to the impacts of climate change, not only in terms of coastal flooding, but also extreme heat and severe winter storms like we saw last winter. And then finally, we want to help our economy, not just economy in general, but economic opportunities. It's pretty easy to get into the downtown core of Boston using almost any mode of transportation. It's much more challenging to reach job centers outside of the downtown, and we're rapidly expanding the number of job opportunities that aren't just in the financial district and that area. Our plan has taken place over sort of four phases. Um, the visioning phase was about developing goals and targets. We're also trying to ensure that complementing the public engagement piece, that we have a really rigorous data framework to work with, and moving beyond traditional transportation measures of congestion and level of service, which we are looking at, we also want to understand the economic and social context of what we're dealing with, which neighborhoods are least well served um, at different times of day or because of certain types of land use issues. Um, the action plan will be coming out next spring with long-term projects and policies, but we've already launched a series of early action projects that I'll tell you more about in a moment. And it's really important to us that we track the progress of our ability to meet the goals and targets that we've set. Um, I sit in the middle here at the Boston Transportation Department of this very large and complex plan and team. Uh, we work directly with the mayor's office and with interagency groups across the city of Boston and at the state level. 
We are guided by a mayoral advisory committee, which is about 23 members of the public and business leaders who were appointed by the mayor to assist with our process. And then we're also working with a series of four different consultant teams. Nelson Nygaard is probably familiar to many of you as a really great transportation planning firm, but we're also doing data analysis with the Dukakis Center at Northeastern University. We're doing really innovative public engagement with a Boston organization called the Interaction Institute for Social Change. And we're trying to give our whole project a unique look and feel by partnering with a local firm called UTL that primarily does planning and architecture. Some of our early action projects that we've already embarked on include Vision Zero initiative, which is happening in many streets to eliminate traffic fatalities, a neighborhood slow streets program that helps us to do traffic calming throughout the city, as well as district planning, connecting our open spaces, and improving our parking structure. In the long term, we're going to be looking at making sure that our projects and policies and plans all reflect the needs of pedestrians, buses, bikes, and drivers. And in the long term, we really want to make sure that we're able to track the kinds of changes that we're making on the street and share them with the public so that after coming out of this really inclusive public engagement process, the public feels as though they both know the kinds of changes and improvements we're making and feel like they're welcome to refine the process as we do specific projects around the city. So right now we've reached fall 2015. I'm going to spend the rest of my time here talking to you about the question campaign, the visioning lab that got us to our vision report, and the kinds of strategies we're using now in the action plan phase to collect project and policy ideas. So what was our criteria from the outset for public engagement? We wanted to make sure that we were working with a variety of partners so that we weren't just trying to individually reach people where they were by ourselves as though BTD could get to everyone and so we enlisted the help of both traditional advocates in transportation and other people at similar agencies as well as community partners at a whole range of organizations dealing with arts and culture and low-income communities and people um, who are not native English speakers and the idea is that by partnering with each of them and making them feel like they're a part of the process, they could help us to spread the word and ensure that people who aren't the usual suspects who come to meetings regularly are really feeling like they can contribute to the plan without attending a traditional public meeting. We wanted to make sure that all neighborhoods are represent, well represented. Some past planning processes have really focused so much on the downtown or the core area that they haven't really felt like they applied to people who lived further out. And finally, we want to make sure that each, at each phase of the process, journalists and city officials in particular are always asking us, like, what are the big ideas? What are we going to be doing in two years? And we've consistently really tried to say we're listening to the public first. We want to start with what they think and use what they are suggesting. At each phase of the process, it's been important for us to both consider the different dimensions that we are working with. We want there to be in-person opportunities so that you can have a face-to-face -face conversation with us and really feel engaged with the process because you've met us in person and in real life. But we recognize that not everyone can come to all meetings, and so we have a really robust online component that balances our work as well. Each um, phase has begun with a really hyper-localized out-on-the-streets campaign that allows people to kind of bump into us out in a place that they see as home or as being a place that they normally spend a lot of their time. But we also recognize that it's very important to bring people together to have conversations with people who are very different from them. And so we culminated with much more centralized events in order to bring people together to reach a stronger consensus. And while we began with an open-ended process, you could donate any kind of question you wanted, we're leading into a very structured process for making some final decisions. We initially collected 5,000 questions through a variety of strategies, again answering that question, what's your question about getting around Boston in the future? The purpose of a question campaign is it let people express themselves and their issues with transportation at whatever their level of expertise was. So if you were someone who could talk about leading pedestrian intervals, you could ask a question about that. But if you just wanted to know why you felt unsafe in a crosswalk, you could ask us a question about that. And we were able to pull from these questions a whole series of both visionary ideas and then also to try to understand what people's concerns were when we looked at them cumulatively. In order to promote the campaign when it started last January, we created a series of really provocative ads that had their own questions and some images of what the future could look like. 
We placed them um, all over the city. They were on the red line and orange line. They were on the sides of trash cans and bus stops. We had them in five local papers and got support to have them on four digital billboards. In this process, we discovered that there are a lot of people who are required to provide about 15% of their advertising space to public service announcements, and we were able to tap into a lot of those networks to get our materials posted. We also built momentum through the media. It really helped every time someone wrote an article about us, whether that was in the Metro, the Globe, or even smaller local papers and some university papers. People started to say, oh wow, there's a truck. I want to go meet the truck, which I'll get to in a moment. We created a website, um, which you can visit now, although it has a very different tone to it, whereas we're collecting ideas. At the time, the very first thing you were asked to do was to donate a question, and there was a portal that just said, what's your question? Give us your zip code. And once you donated a question, you could read and like other questions. This is a pretty basic example, but you could also see them on a map and understand which zip codes were asking which kind of questions, and you could sort them by tags and themes to see the kinds of issues that were emerging. We also relied heavily on social media, and again, using our partners, we're able to really leverage the power of Facebook and Twitter. This is what it looked like if you came to the website and you could say what are the questions being asked in Roslindale. You could scroll through the 193 questions that were asked from that neighborhood and see if the people who live near you had similar or different issues than you did. Our community partners helped with Twitter, as I mentioned. And then we had this question truck. Given our timeline, we were going to be doing public engagement in January, and we really weren't sure the best way to be out in the field in such a cold month. And we hired this amazing truck that we were able to use a local artist to help us wrap the truck with some provocative questions and images and design the whole interior. And we were promised that it would be really warm. But if you know anything about Boston last January, you'll know that we got a whole series of storms. It had barely snowed when the truck arrived, and we got three blizzards in the time that the truck was out. It was not nearly as warm as we anticipated, but it was a really great resource because we were able to visit 15 neighborhoods and talk to people who had really different perspectives about Boston's mobility issues. You could talk to someone when you arrived. You could ride on the side of a truck and People love doing that. You could write on one of these plexiglass hexagons that we use to fill the interior of the truck, like this. And you could write your idea right on a card, and we recorded all of those. Kids came, people, um, teenagers stopped by on their way home from school. We had hot chocolate. Uh, it was just a really great way to talk to people in a time when most people didn't want to be outside, and yet they stopped and had conversations with us about improving transportation. And surprisingly, few questions were explicitly about snow. More of them were about resiliency or reliability kind of across the board than they were about the snow clearance in, in particular. It was great to get 5,000 questions, but that's really only useful if you can organize them. So we divided all the questions we got into, eventually into nine themes. Um, each theme was a cross-modal sort of overarching theme that we used to sort them into different categories. Um, I'll talk about them in a minute, but the idea was that by organizing them into themes, we could have people review those questions and determine which ones really jumped out as being the best representation, the priority question for a particular theme. So initially, we actually had 12 themes. We learned very quickly that miscellaneous is completely useless as a theme. <laughs> We put sustainability and resiliency together because we thought that there were a lot of parallels in the kinds of questions people were asking. Um, equity also became an overarching principle rather than just being a theme. And so this is a breakdown of the kinds of themes, access, reliability, and experiential quality being the most um, commonly asked question, but safety being one that had really specific and vital concerns coming out of it that needed to be addressed fairly quickly. This is what the question review session looked like. This group of people would have gotten a series of questions. They would have read the same questions as the person sitting next to them, discussed which of those 100 to 150 questions were the most powerful or seemed to be representative of their set, and then worked with their group to say, for this entire theme, what are the issues that we want to highlight? And so as you can see over the course of a morning, this is about 60 different interagency partners, um, partners from our community came together and said, these are the things that you want to be focused on based on having read all of these questions. So together the entire room read every question. Actually every question was read at least twice by the entire room. But we wanted to go back to the public yet again to make sure that what we had thought we'd heard was really what they thought wanted us to hear. So we invented something called a visioning lab. We wanted people to make sure that they were coming to something that was hands-on, that was engaging, that made them excited about transportation. We wanted to make sure it was something that felt accessible to many different kinds of people. We had to promise people 
I couldn't describe it very well before it happened, but I kept telling them, you're going to have a good time. You're going to feel like you learned something. It's going to be worth your time. And everyone who came really had that experience. And we also wanted to make sure they understood that this was just one point in a much longer process. The Visioning Lab was held in a space called the China Trade Center at the corner of Washington and Boylston Street here in Boston. It was right next to a tea station. It was right on the corner of a neighborhood, but also very close to downtown and very close to one of our biggest parks. And this is what it looked like on the inside. Each of our themes had two panels that said, you know, what does this look like to you? What does a more affordable or more equitable transportation system look like to you? In the hexagon, colored hexagons, you can see there are the priority questions. The rectangles below them were the kind of statement versions of those questions, and then we had images we'd collected as well as smaller images that we'd given donated online by other participants. And some people just came and they read the contents of the wall. You got plexiglass hexagons that you could use to say, these are the ideas that resonate with me, this is the kind of vision that I'm looking for, these are the goals that I want. You could use thumbs up stickers to say which questions you liked. You could have conversations about the images and the things that were written on the wall. You could comment on the ideas or comment on other people's ideas. This happened a lot. And you could go to our creation station to design. You could either write a poem, you could write an idea, you could make a collage. Uh, people were really creative in showing what accessible transportation meant to them, what sustainable transportation meant to them. We also had all 5,000 questions posted. And we had a whole data gallery that allowed people to see what the existing conditions were in Boston, both to find themselves and to understand what issues other people were facing. We partnered with five local artists. This is a children's book author who wrote a story about walking around the city that she acts out with small children, which you see her doing here. We also had a young artist who did these beautiful paintings and a dance troupe, which was a huge draw for attracting people to say, hey, what's going on? What's going on here? Why, why are you here? And they would come in and engage with us at the lab. Um, a local nonprofit called the Boston Cyclist Union provided bike tune-ups as well. And we had a panel discussion about using the civic space around transportation to build dialogue and community. The mayor kicked off the whole event, which made it um, probably the busiest time, went right at noon when it first opened. And Overall, we felt like we got the kind of information that we needed to develop a really comprehensive set of goals and targets. So now, having developed that vision framework, we are trying to determine the best way to move forward with projects and policies, and we have a series of things we've just begun, or we've been working on for about a month now, with the action plan. Um, we thought it was important both to create um, a strong narrative for why we are eventually selecting the projects and policies that we are, and we're asking people to tell us about their specific experiences and ideas. We're having idea collection that happens all over the city, similar to the truck being out in the field, and we're eventually going to get into some roundtable discussions. So briefly, uh, Share Your Trip with BTD is a program where we pair Boston residents who have applied to be part of the program with Boston Transportation Department staff members. They take a trip together, it's audio recorded, it's photographed, and it's shared on our website. This is Bree, who is a mom who lives in a neighborhood called Roslindale. She takes the commuter rail every day with her three-year-old. And her story was really about the things on the commuter rail that could be changed to better accommodate children. So one issue you can see here is that strollers can only really get on the train. There's a handicap entrance, but that same car that she's pushing her stroller onto is also the quiet car, which is a really problematic policy. So that was one of her many ideas. But rather than talking about a hypothetical person who did some hypothetical trip, we really are excited about the fact that we now have a series of stories about people who have real experiences, and we can point to what they've done as examples. Um, another trip was with our Transportation Commissioner, Gina Fiandaka, and a man named Victor, who took a special elderly services van, which is provided, um, is offered to low-income seniors who need to get to medical, um, medical opportunities. So Victor was actually going to a health study at Northeastern um, that he's been a part of that has dramatically improved his own personal mobility over the last several months. Um, he used to be in a wheelchair, and he can now walk with a cane, which we're pretty excited about. Ideas on the street is what our pop-up is called. People encounter our trailer, which is pulled by a bike around the city, along with our vision, goals, and objectives. And as they come by, they can add maps, they can add hexagons, and share their ideas for specific policies and projects. Um, we've, again, we've had people of all ages who've engaged with us in a variety of ways. 
And our um, last thing is coming up in November is a series of idea roundtables where we'll pose groups of people with a series of challenges and questions and help them work together to come up with specific policy and project strategies that they think will address the challenges we've provided. And that's it for me. I will hand it off to the next presenter, Mary Beth. Okay, hey everybody. Let's see. All right, can everyone hear me? You sound good. Okay, great. Um, well, I'm going to talk today about uh, social media exclusively as a public involvement tactic and or avenue. Um, I'm hoping I don't need to explain necessarily um, what an MPO is uh, for this audience, but uh, essentially we are the Regional Policy Planning and Programming Authority for Nashville, Tennessee and its surrounding counties. Um, so it's a little bit grass tops in its mission. Um, we do major planning studies. Uh, we're funded by the Federal Highway Administration and required to do public involvement around our plans and programs. Um, and we fund every mode of surface transportation uh, projects in uh, about a 10 county region, serving 1.5 million people. Um, and in 2010, on our last plan update, it's a, a signature product of uh, the MPO or any MPO, it, it's required by the Federal Highway Administration to be updated um, every five years and we're in the middle of getting ready to launch our 2040 update. But for the 2035 plan, the city and county mayors who governed the MPO executive board decided to take a different turn and change policy um, away from a strictly roadway uh, type perspective to be more multimodal, more inclusive of uh, modes that would support livability as the region continues to grow. The MPO projects Nashville will accommodate an additional 1 million or so people over the next 25 years. Uh, so we're in a, in a growth period and that has a lot of implications for congestion um, and so forth. So when I came on to do communications around that particular plan update and um, the launch of the public involvement phase around that, Twitter and Facebook were sort of just starting to pick up steam and become a part of the mainstream in terms of how people are getting their information. Um, and so we decided we definitely needed to have a presence um, in, those, in those channels in order to get our information out. Um, but I just kind of want to start by giving a disclaimer about social media and and basically you know what what you should expect if, if you're launching into these channels or you're trying something new in them uh, in terms of your return on investment and your time. Um, it's very effective at basically sort of lowering the threshold of awareness. Um, there was a, a great article by Malcolm Gladwell in the New Yorker in 2010 where he talked about the Facebook page for the Save Darfur Coalition and how they had 1.2 million members who had donated on average nine cents per person. Um, and you know, a spokesperson for Save Darfur said, we wouldn't necessarily gauge someone's value to the advocacy movement based on what they've given, um, making a donation to that cause, meaning they've actually, you know, taken action or done some type of behavior in support of an idea or an effort. Uh, but he said, it's a powerful mechanism to engage a critical population. They inform their community, attend events, and volunteer. It's not something you can measure by looking at a ledger. In other words, Facebook activism succeeds not by motivating people to make a real sacrifice, but by motivating them to do things that people do when they're not motivated enough to make a real sacrifice. We're a long way from the lunch counters um, of the uh, civil rights movement of the 1960s. So um, it's really just, you know, if you're posting an article or um, 
something on Facebook, you're not really doing anything to impact a cause. You're not turning out at a public meeting and having your voice be heard. Um, you, if you catch something from us on social media, it's, it's basically just sort of, you know, it's a word of mouth marketing tool. And I included the definition of word of mouth marketing there, um, especially since research, uh, recent research uh, polling says that 65% of Americans are getting news through word of mouth. But it's a, it's a form of advertising, there is a science to it, and it's where people who don't stand to gain anything personally from promoting something put their reputations on the line, and every time they make a recommendation, whether they're satisfied or dissatisfi dissatisfied, um, they, they tell people how much they like it or dislike something, whether that's a business, a product, a service, event, a government agency, and so forth. So from a public relations standpoint, in the information revolution, message warriors are the foot soldiers in the campaign to capture hearts and minds. Social media has irrevocably altered the reputation landscape, and where institutions used to control their own reputation, now our stakeholders do. It's not what you say about yourself that matters as much as what your constituencies say about you. And it's really hard to get your message out these days, um, but people are reporting getting their news from social media, not your, the, the newspaper that you hold in your hand and get delivered to your doorstep. There's certainly still some of that. There's certainly still a lot of people getting news from their local broadcast television station. Um, but news online is huge, especially with mobile devices, cell phones, and tablets and people are getting their news from the web. Um, in terms of the government nonprofit sector, uh, people are using social media for political and civic activity, and these users are more likely than others to participate in offline civic activities, meaning show up at your public meeting, um, show up at a walk score audit, or whatever it might be. 85% are more likely to sign petitions, um, they're just more civically engaged with their elected officials, with their local government agencies. In terms of reaching news media, um, you know, Facebook and Twitter are huge avenues for connecting with journalists who are getting story ideas and uh, clickbait for the research that they're doing on their stories from Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Um, Facebook users recently are, are known to be more politically engaged, more trusting. Um, they have more close relationships. Again, that's key to word of mouth marketing. Um, basically, millennials, all of them are on social media. If you want to reach uh, younger people, that you have to be participating in social media. Um, and again, just going back to our particular sector, um, government or nonprofit typically, um, you know, people are searching for political info, posting their views. Um, a lot of people were looking for when the stimulus uh, was coming down. They were looking online to see where monies got spent on those um, Recovery Act projects um, proactively. Um, and the latest uh, GovTwit, I think the count for uh, um, uh, state and local government accounts was over a thousand. So governments are sort of getting the message that they need to, if they're going to be doing public involvement, public engagement, they need to be participating in these channels. The public has mixed views about their expectations um, in terms of to the extent their gov local government agencies are participating in social media. Um, you know, a lot of people think, oh, it's just the same information delivered in a different channel, and a lot of times it is. I'm going to go into that a little bit in, here in a bit in terms of how you can mix it up. But um, they do sort of have an expectation um, that they ought to be able to connect with, you know, the agencies that represent them online. That expectation is there. So going back to the 2035 transportation plan, um, you know, it is a public document. It is sort of a wonky, federally required thing that the MPOs across the nation have to produce, Nashville being no exclusion. exclusion. Um, but working with my executive director, we did establish a brand 
for that document in terms of how we were going to approach talking about it, not just in public presentations that we made to various stakeholder groups and any public meetings we held, but also in our social media channels, Facebook and Twitter um, being the main ones. Um, and it's important when you sort of go into this, you know, your messaging, just taking some time to really think about that and then deciding what social media success is going to mean to your organizational initiatives. Because you're going to spend some time in these channels. And then make choices that logically support your pursuit of those goals. And if you don't have something to say, it's okay. No one's making you talk anymore. The conversation has been joined to death. Um, but, you know, basically I sort of had a carte blanche to talk about whatever I wanted to talk about in these channels and manage them accordingly using my best judgment so long as I stayed within these the topic areas that was concurrent with the 2035 plan. And so this is some of the language from the plan and I used this as a framework and or sort of you know signposts for you know what I was going to you know sort of mine content around to post in these channels. So um, livability, sustainability, prosperity, diversity, th this is a tagline for our MPO to this day. Um, but you know, livability, that sounds like sort of a really amorphous thing. What does that mean? Well, at the time Secretary LaHood talked about how being livability is your ability to take your kids to school, go to work, see a doctor, drop by the post office, go out to dinner and a movie and play with your kids at the park without having to get in your car. So choice, transportation choice, sustainability, um, you know, not sacrificing our natural resources, our financial stability, um, our health, prosperity, you know, we have a lot of business goals around our transportation system, uh, you know, freight movement, logistics, um, access to jobs and continuing education and schools. And then diversity, making sure that we have a transportation system that serves everyone and who are those that might be left behind and for what reasons. And are we designing our facilities um, to uh, meet, meet the con context sensitive solutions and that sort of thing. Again, sort of wonky, but this is the source material. Um, these are the goals of the plan, so I, I won't read over this, but um, Again, this is sort of, as long as I maintain some sort of um, shorthand understanding of what the plan was about, its major goals and objectives, um, I could go forth and mine for content without having to sort of go back and get advance approval from my director every single time because I wasn't going to step on a landmine. Um, and then these are the major policy initiatives, you know, boiling a 250 page document down into three major themes so that you can talk about it in an elevator and or a 140 character t tweet is extremely important um, because, again, if it's not simple, no one's going to be able to pay attention to it, no one's going to be able to latch on to it, and no one's going to be able to take it and carry it forward through that word of, marth word of mouth marketing that we talked about at the top. So the major policy provisions of the plan, the first being a bold new vision for mass transit, connecting how to connect the region through um, this particular mode, and how to fund that vision. The second being increasing our support for active transportation and walking, uh, walkable communities, um, urban design, and that sort of thing. And then three, Preserving and enhancing our existing roadway network, using technology to keep people and goods moving, um, making sure we're keeping the roadway safe and well maintained before we go out and build expensive new facilities. Um, this is just a little side note on, um, you know, writing for these particular channels. Again, I see a lot of tweets out there where they're truncated or it's just not really good language that's going to make me want to click on that link and take a deeper dive into the information, which is what you really want people to do when you're dealing with this type of, again, as I, as I said, sort of grass tops, wonky content. But how many people know the average word count for a news headline to be fully understood? The answer is eight words. Um, 
and Jacob Nielsen, who um, you know uh, does it's a, a, a major uh, media expert, said it's the height of arrogance to assume that all of your web visitors are extraordinarily interested in everything you write. More likely, they'll scan. So 50% of web visitors don't actually read paragraphs; they scan. So you know you need to have somebody at the helm of the, your social media channels who knows how to communicate in a way that is active and engaging. So writing to be read, the verb is the story. <laughs> Short, simple, active, and positive. Um, and this is just a quote from Edward R. Murrow, who's, you know, of course, a legendary American broadcaster. But, um, you know, we're still trying to figure out what to say and how to say it. It doesn't, it doesn't matter that it's in Twitter now. Um, you know, five years from now, it'll be something different from Twitter. But we still need to be um, think of thinking about that and and putting people in those positions who who really have a knack for language. Um, this is the stay involved section of our website. It's sort of a hub for where you can come to plug in with the MPO, um, and it has some some really friendly introductory page copy. Um, you know, here's your opportunity to tell all, revolutionary or simple. We want to hear it. If you live or work in Middle Tennessee. Your on-the-ground perspective can help the MPO formulate what it will take to maintain a high quality of life in the years to come as our region continues to grow. Learn more about growth scenarios and join the discussion. We'll help put your ideas into action. And then we have a variety of ways for people to plug in, start getting our info, including links to our major social media channels. So this is sort of just a, a top-level look at my content management strategy, and I'll go through this really quickly. Um, but for Facebook, um, you know, this is an old, old screenshot of, you know, the old school view of, you know, before Facebook launched a, a new facelift for itself. But I kept it up because you can see the variety of links that I've got posted, different sorts of content, you know, from information about our public meetings to statistical information or an article from USA Today. It also has our disclaimer on the left there, where uh, while we welcome public participation, this page is moderated by a moderator. Um, but the first tip I would, I would say in terms of selecting uh, what types of things you might like to post would be to think broadly, think beyond your geographic backyard. Um, you know, I post a lot of national news because um, the things that cities are dealing with across the country, you know, dead malls and so forth. I mean, that is not an issue that is germane to Nashville, Tennessee. There's dead malls, ever, you know, dead and dying malls that are being repurposed for mixed-use development everywhere. Um, so if I pick something from the Atlantic cities, um, it's, it's, it still should have relevance to a Nashville audience. The second is don't be a bore. This content is already sort of, you know, not really anything that anybody thinks about as part of their daily life. Nobody leaves their house in the morning thinking about infrastructure, but they get on that infrastructure in order to get to their job or whatever, or get their kid to school. And so um, you're also, um, you know, sort of dealing with the fact that people come to social media in order to be social. So if you, if you govern your page using a voice that is very sort of matter of fact, not friendly, not humorous, not engaging, you're not going to gain audience and you might even lose audience. However, you, you should be um, feeling like you can post things that are um, a little bit nerdy. We have a lot of people following our page who are bike pet enthusiasts, who are part of advocacy organizations that are oriented around that and they like to see content around um, the latest uh, innovative thing in street design that maybe another city is doing or something or that we're doing and they tend to interact with that comment content they comment on it they like it um, so you want to mix in a little bit of that even though it is a little bit um, down in the weeds you also want to tell people you're on Facebook in your email signature in your community presentations um, on your business cards wherever so that people know oh they they're present in this channel I can go interact with them there I don't have to if I prefer not to get their emails I don't you know I don't have to sign up for their emails I can just look at what they're doing on Facebook you also can use Facebook to um, tag other organizations and people that's sort of an aspect of friendliness and um, 
openness. You know, I can go on to Walk Bike Nashville's uh, Facebook page or Transit Now Nashville's Facebook page and comment on their stuff as the MPO. Let them know that I'm listening to them. Um, and it also uh, creates um, traffic back to my page. Um, and then also you want to make sure that you have a, a governing Web 2.0 policy statement. I mentioned, um, you know, where it says on this page, comments here are moderated. Um, you know, I, you will have people who will troll your page who are not necessarily in agreement with what it is you might be doing. I mean, you know, I had a troll on our Facebook page who was just really hating on bicyclists and wanted to go on our page and um, just really just rail on cyclists, you know, when our position is that, um, you know, users of those particular modes, walking and bicycling, are, are in this day and age vulnerable <laughs> and we need to do our best to impre improve safety because we've been building things for the automobile essentially for the last 50 years and so I have kind of a three strikes and you're out type policy um, if someone chooses to get personal or um, um, defame any person or organization I will block them from the page and you need to have a, a an official because we're a public agency uh, policy statement that backs you up in those instances because um, they'll they'll write the mayor they'll write their council person if that you know um, they just you know you, there are trolls on the internet it's just a fact of life um, and then also if if they don't like it offline they won't like it online choose content that is interesting that you would be inclined to to uh, relate to somebody over dinner at a restaurant and so forth so people come to social media to be social Twitter, um, you know, you need to listen first. Um, uh, it's a great, Twitter is a great way to find out what's happening out there, just searching. Um, you know, I can just do a Twitter search at search.twitter.com and search Nashville Commute and see what people are saying about their commute. I mean, it's a great anecdotal research tool, um, you know, to figure out what people are actually saying. Um, your identity on Twitter matters because people are going to be, you want people to be able to find you. So in your bio, uh, the name that you actually choose for yourself, make sure it's searchable, make sure it's easily identifiable. Um, don't choose something generic that gives me no clue that, you know, your, um, you know, your, your agency is located in Chicago or whatever it might be. Uh, people, uh, Again, who's tweeting matters, how it's written. People like to read and retweet content that's grammatically correct. Um, and the number one word that's retweeted is you. Uh, retweets are noun heavy, third person verbs, things doing things, think newspaper headlines. So again, who you have at the helm, a lot of agencies I see have um, people with a with a architecture or planning background. That's fine, but make sure that they have some um, acumen on how to write and phrase things in these channels because you want to make sure you get optimum engagement and that style of communication really is important. Twitter is all about reciprocity so what's in it for me? Um, when I say stroke egos you want to love and share the love and if an organization has a Twitter handle and your tweet content has anything to do with them whatsoever reference them, use the handle, it leads to retweets and followbacks. Um, Twitter is amazing for breaking news. We had a catastrophic thousand-year flood here in Nashville um, where we, our transit, local transit agency lost 40% of their vehicle fleet. There was a hashtag at that time going around, uh, hashtag Nashville flood. You could, you could click on that hashtag and get real-time information about your bus line, um, you know, whether it was going to be a backup or not, uh, whether your power you could communicate with our local utilities that way, um, and it's you know it's all about staff resources. So having somebody to be able to be on that in a breaking news situation um, is you got to commit the personnel resources to it if you're gonna if you're gonna do it. Uh, one tweet a month, you know, I see some accounts like that. That's just not acceptable. And um, Twitter is great for shrinking the emotional distance between us and our and your customers. Um, it, it basically, it's, it's just, it builds trust. A new study shows that social media triggers 
the release of the generosity trust chemical in our brains. Um, and just give it a few minutes a day. People say, oh my gosh, this is so overwhelming. I don't have the time. Um, you know, just, you know, baby step it. Uh, you need to try to monitor it in real time as much as you can. Um, don't automate your tweets. Your smartphone should be a tool for this. Um, and then the 70, 20, 10 rule. 70% 70, 70 of your tweets should be about um, other, other uh you know, just general comment content about your issue, 20% about other partners or stakeholders, other organizations, and only 10% about yourself. Don't make it all about you. Um, I'll, I need to wrap it up, I know, but these are just some organizations and um, industries that are following us. And again, all about reciprocity. We follow you back um, if you're relevant to our business or our policy initiatives in any way, shape, or form. And at the bottom there are some good Twitter handles for um, in the transportation sector, uh, planning, land use, architecture, and so forth, for content that you can use for Facebook or um, your blog or whatever. Um, and if you have to prove that to your boss that this is all worth your time, Bitly um, is, a, is a great method for um, tracking how many people click through onto your content. Um, and you, if you'll notice there, when the 2010 census came out, I had 52 click-throughs on that particular link, um, and that's because I was using the hashtag to participate in that national discussion um, in real time during the press conference put out by the Census Bureau. And that's me, and I will um, turn it over now to our next presenter, Kimberly. Okay, just one moment. Okay, good afternoon. <clears throat> um, I'm pleased this afternoon to just highlight some of our grant findings um, from the past year. Our grant ended, it actually began in 2013 and ended in May of 2015. Uh, the grant transpired over a year and it was entitled Innovative Strategies for Public Involvement, a Case Study of Tr Tennessee Department of Transportation. Uh, this grant study, which was mentioned by Christine earlier, was a collaborative effort between the Universities of Tennessee State University and the University of Memphis. We were selected by the Department of Transportation, Tennessee Department of Transportation, to identify innovative strategies to support support their public involvement efforts across the state of Tennessee. TDOT realized that there were opportunities for improvement in this area, and our primary goal as a research team was to provide best practice document for TDOT to utilize in their transportation planning, especially their long-range planning efforts across the state. Uh, the purpose of this research project was to help TDOT realize the full potential they have in making a more positive impact throughout all the communities within the state, and in particular by imp implementing strategies that will yield more public involvement. The faculty members and the research team is comprised of myself as the public in, uh, principal investigator, along with um, scholars as co-principal investigators, Dr. Stephanie Ivey and Dr. Larry Moore, who are both serving as associate professors within the Department of Civil Engineering at the University of uh, Memphis. Uh, throughout the life of our grant, we had an opportunity to have four graduate, uh, three graduate research assistants, two from the University of Memphis, one from Tennessee State, and then an undergraduate research assistant as well from Tennessee State University. The focus of our grant was to ensure TDOT's transportation decision-making efforts are sound and offer the greatest benefit to as many stakeholders as possible. The research team developed a best practice guide highlighting innovative strategies to gain greater public participation in transportation decision making and improve accessibility for stakeholders to participate throughout the state of Tennessee. 
Um, our approach with our grant, we basically had a number of eight major tasks that we uh, worked on throughout the grant, and I'm just going to highlight those um, eight tasks to give you an idea of what took place within our year and a half grant. Um, on our first task, we had that opportunity to conduct face-to-face -face interviews, online surveys of TDOT staff, and evaluated interviews and survey results, and prepared a TDOT's past practices. Uh, we prepared um, an actual document that captured the findings um, from our online survey and our face-to-face -face interviews. Um, what we pulled from um, our findings um, from TDOT staff interviewing uh, for task one is TDOT is actively working to achieve public participation in their long-range planning process. But what the staff uh, members that we interviewed recognized that there was potential for improving the process and outcomes through new resources, um, i.e., for example, guided uh, guidance document, expanded web. I know we, we spoke a lot about social media and social media presence. Um, and another um, point that was highlighted through the findings was better internal comments and the use of a diverse set of approaches for engaging citizens. And this is the main reason why our grant team was hired to uh, conduct this research is to try to find out uh, more of a diverse group of approaches to engage citizens. Our second task was basically to look at the historical documentation of TDOT within the four regions. So regions, their four regions are already, including headquarters, are already doing um, public involvement efforts. So what our team wanted to do was first look at what is being done, what are some community partners they are already um, uh, collaborating with, stakeholders that they are already working with, and we wanted to look at that to identify past practices that yielded useful input, input and determine effectiveness or lack thereof for current strategies. Then, um, going beyond TDOT, we wanted to look at best practices used by other states. So we conducted, uh, we did an intense review of 50 states' public involvement um, plans. Um, we looked at uh, what's on their website. We did um, a couple telephone uh, conversations and also looked at documents that were available on the web as in regards to um, outreach strategies to get individuals engaged in their public involvement efforts. Um, some of the, the agencies that we looked at was MPOs and then also departments of transportation. We evalu evaluated the advantage and disadvantages of each approaches in other states. We prepared a written document summarizing the best practices in other states, and then we identified the best practices most suitable for the use within the four regions in Tennessee. Um, task four, um, after we looked at what TDOT has done in the past, we looked at a nationwide search on best practice documents, we wanted to um, basically come up with a community profile for our regions. Each region in um, the state of Tennessee um, is very unique in its own right, and what we wanted to do was to look at Who's, who are those groups, um, what are the demographics within these four regions, identify key partners within the four regions. And we were able to do this by the use of geographic information maps, uh, which is GIS, um, through the gen uh, geographic information systems. From that, we were able to create a community profile um, for best practice toolbox and rubric. Um, it focused on first identifying key partners within each region, as I mentioned earlier, who have demonstrated the ability to provide effective communication and who may enhance and attract an improved balance of attendees at future meetings. Secondly, identify tools which can be used to support the level of engagement and involvement by the community. So as you see, this is the GIS map of the four regions here at, in Tennessee. We created the uh, best practice toolbox of all the strategies that we mentioned. There was over 100 some strategies that we pulled from TDOT and then also the other 50 states. Um, we actually have an instructional document which basically shows um, what's created to help the user on how to use and understand what the GIS data is and how it can be used to as a companion document to go along with GIS data. Um, some of the tools that we were able to pull um, 
identified public facilities like libraries. Um, you can do layers uh, to show that in the G GIS mapping uh, location, uh, FM radio, digital television, uh, location of media, publishing companies. Uh, these partners were also selected from a wide range of groups uh, representing diverse religious, civic, uh, social, education, and ethnical backgrounds. Um, right here at the upper right, you see the best practice rubric, and basically it was developed to identify various themes. Uh, this include how accessi accessible its ability to promote interaction and feedback as well as increase engagement among ver various population groups, including minority, youth, elderly, uh, those that are in the protected class. The purpose of the rubric was to help the research team determine each state's tools level of effectiveness based on upon these themes. So an example of compiling a community profile, uh, looking um, at an example here in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, Region 3, and looking at the Edgewood community, um, there was a, a, fic a fictional uh, project that's going to take, that took place in Nashville, illustrates um, a bike uh, lane, dedicated for a bike lane along the, bounder, the bounds of the corridor. And the proposed corridor is highlighted in red, as you see here. Um, looking around that area, we notice that uh, according to the Housing and Urban Development, the community um, of Edge Hill um, is considered 60 to 70 percent low to moderate income, based on at least 51 percent of those households in those census tracts with incomes at or below 80 percent of the area medium income. The darkest brown to the lightest brown uh, represents, represents the highest to lowest percentage of low to moderate income in that respect that's given to census tracts. Along this corridor, you see Vanderbilt University Medical Center, and then you also, also see elementary schools, five religious institutions, libraries, public spaces. Um, and how is this effective to public administrators um, in urban planning, in transportation decision making? What this GIS map can do and help officials and other decision making body members is to help them look at um, ways and different facilities and different ways to inform individuals on where they can provide input and provide input on public information, uh, public involvement strategies and methods. So looking at these surrounding facilities um, will be helpful as well. So task five, um, once we figured out using the GIS database to figure out the organizations within the four regions, um, organizations Organizations such as Community Action Center, uh, Livable Memphis, um, government agencies including planning, transit agencies also attended uh, focus group sessions within each region. The four regions are Region 1, Knoxville, 2, Chattanooga, 3, Nashville, and then 4, Jackson, and Memphis. So we planned focus group meetings across these four regions. We conducted the focus group discussions in each region to obtain critical input about particular public involvement strategies. Use results of the focus group discussions to develop uh, public involvement strategies best suited for each region. So prior to the meetings, these organizations, individuals uh, that represent in these organizations uh, were given the best practice toolbox. They were able to actually see the over um, uh, a hundred so uh, tools that might fit best for their region. So they reviewed it, they came to the focus group, and we had a discussion on what tools would work best for their particular region. Um, from that, we were able to move forward with um, creating um, a best practice uh, set of uh, tools that would work best for each region. Uh, I have a couple of pictures here that just highlight some of the involvement. We also not only did we only not only did we include uh, community partners, uh, different agencies, we also included students in the, uh, from the Tennessee State University in the Urban Studies class, as you see in the upper right. We also included University of Memphis civil engineering students. Uh, we conducted two classes there. But as you see, we're engaged getting input on 
how uh, TDOT can better inform, not only inform, but also engage given their particular communities. From the focus group, um, those individuals who attended the focus group were able to participate in a survey that we had. Um, also, those who were not able to attend the four regional uh, focus group sessions had an opportunity to go back, review those tools, and answer the survey questions at hand. So we conducted an online survey in March 2015, uh, consisted of 12 questions, mainly pertaining to their past participation efforts um, and their awareness of participation. We received 45 responses, predominantly from Region 3, which is Nashville and urban areas, 93%. Um, the focus group survey results, participants, uh, demographics, if you look here, we had a huge demographic that either was a senior citizen or represented the population of sen senior citizens, and then you see as disabled. Um, the sample size is not large enough for statistical analysis. However, we looked at the responses uh, dealing per uh, mainly with uh, senior citizens and disabled populations within the next few slides. And these two groups are part of the environmental justice protected group. So 74% of uh, survey results, 74% had never participated in public involvement meetings or activities with TDOT. And this was uh, mind-blowing uh, mind to us as researchers and our research team to uh, find out that every time we went to these focus groups and those individuals that were present and even those in the survey uh, mentioned that they never uh, participated in public involvement meetings or activities um, that was hosted by TDOT. Uh, 96 believed that it was important for citizens to participate in public involvement opportunities with TDOT. What these two statistics uh, highlight is that the fact that it's not the lack of recognition of the importance of engagement, but rather other factors that limit involvement. This indicates that it's likely that public involvement will increase if changes are made to address reported barriers. So what are some barriers, and I know some of us that's been in this field for years and studied and had actually worked with populations and trying to get communities to get engaged, there are barriers uh, to participation. And what we found from the survey and, and participants using a five locker rating scale, five being the most a highly uh, re uh, rated barrier, uh, and, and one uh, zero would be less likely. Uh, number one, the lack of awareness of opportunity to involve is the biggest barrier. Uh, number two, meetings held in an inconvenient location. Three, meetings held in inconvenient times. Four, lack of understanding about how citizens can contribute in the decision-making process. And five, lack of time to attend meetings. Um, looking in particular to our uh, two protected groups, the senior citizens and the disabled uh, citizens, what we found um, with the end of 16 citizens and a number of non-disabled citizens part of the survey is if we looked at uh, both columns there, number five, um, the lack of confidence that opinions would be taken seriously. Um, some individuals felt, even when we had our uh, focus group discussions, that even if they presented their opinions, how will they be taken? Are, are their opinions going to be valid? Or would they be uh, incorporated in, into the overall final design of the transportation project? Um, lack of understanding of, about how to contribute was an issue. Um, and I know one thing that we always think of as public administrators and, and those who uh, engage the public in decision-making processes um, is that we always look at like a time uh, the lack of time, but if you notice the lack of time it, it either ranks th third or second. Um, the main thing here that's focused on both um, sides is the lack of awareness and then also the lack of confidence that shows up of their uh, input. And then the focus group results facilitating participation. So how uh, will we be able to um, get people to participate even more? Um, from the survey results, one, opportunities to participate online through surveys and web conferences as we have today. Um, 
people still want to be able to have access um, using um, online, more technology-driven based uh, opportunities to participate. Number two, meetings held within the communities. We need to meet people where they are, um, set up meetings where people will be located that's more convenient um, for uh, communities. Uh, three, more communication from TDOT on how to input, how input will be used, and then the greater use of social media. Um, going back to senior citizens and dis, uh, disabled cit uh, citizens, um, if we note the number one um, on both sides is more communication from TDOT about how their input is used. So not only will TDOT gather input or transportation or transit agencies gather input, but citizens want to know, especially these two populations, how will they input will be used. Some of the open-ended questions, uh, survey results of what we found was uh, the first one uh, quoted here, uh, a survey recipient quoted, have neighborhood leaders distributed information in newsletters, churches, etc., and hold many meetings in the neighborhood <clears throat> because it's hard to get residents to participate if they don't find out about it from someone they know and it's not yield uh, near to their home. So it's important um, what we're seeing from citizens' voices is actually to meet people where they are. Another one quickly is the use of text messaging for voting. Use places people shop like Walmart, Kmart, shopping centers to outreach instead of governmental buildings. Use public schools and private schools to reach students and their parents. Um, then to conclude with our research, we looked at um, taking everything that we gathered from tasks one through five and even gathering the information from our survey and our focus group, we wanted to actually conduct uh, pilot projects where throughout the four regions to show, um, to try to implement some of these strategies that best fit their region. Um, the primary goal was to select these effective strategies to help TDOT secure more of an excellent public involvement um, for Pacific projects in the future. Um, we were not, given to time constraints and low funding for travel throughout the state of Tennessee, we were not able to try, we were not able to hold uh, four actual pilot projects. What we did do was for regions one and region two, come up with a hypothetical uh, pilot project. So there was projects that are going to take place, public involvement meetings, and what we did was provide TDOT with a hypothetical uh, pilot instructional sheet that said, okay, this is what we found within these regions to inform uh, citizens and to engage them. These are the tools that we found. So for an example, for Knoxville to inform, we said to use a portable message board and social media Hootsuite as a management tool that provides efficiency in the use of multiple so social media platforms like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, to inform the public about public information meetings. Not only to inform, but also tools that engage, to increase public participation through the implementation of social media platforms, Hootsuite Suite in Texas and will be used to encourage public engagement before, during, and after a PI meeting. So we tried to um, implement our pilot studies in Region 3 and 4, um, but due to implement weather in March, we were not able to implement um, those tools in Franklin. Um, we did try in Jackson, we tried to coordinate going through the Jackson Housing Authority, that which is aimed at more of the environmental justice populations, minority and low income. We gave over 500 brochures were passed out, and then um, by JHA a week before the meeting, but no one showed up to the meeting. So what happened? So basically what happened, um, we did not use the right community leader to um, to stimulate the information or to make the community aware. So what we did, we went back to the drawing board and met with TDOT and we actually met with them and said, hey, let's come up with a brainstorm and lunching with Jackson Housing Authority to see what best ways to engage them and, and why there was a low turnout. What we did, we uh, went and we met with the community members to engage them. Um, and talk to them. Um, those that were represented was the grant team along, along with TDOT and um, JHA uh, members. What, uh, why we had over 10 to 12 participants, 
what we found was that basically out of this how, uh, brainstorming meeting, the reason why a lot of people were not able to come is because the flyers arrived too late. A lot of those individuals that received flyers at the housing community center um, pay their rent um, the first part of the month, and if we wanted to give a flyer as those individuals paid rent, we should have made sure those flyers were there at a given time. Um, just quickly, um, we mentioned um, what they what we also found for future meetings is um, due to limited access to the internet, community members prefer information matters to be text messaged. Um, by phone, door-to-door -door invitation, or just word of mouth. And the major thing that we took away from this and we shared with TDOT was identifying the appropriate community leader or entity who best engages with the community members will produce a better turnout to the public me uh, meetings at hand and allow face-to-face follow-up meetings after um, those public information meetings or community engagement meetings took place. The best practice tools engagement, so after all our research was done in the field, we actually conducted a workshop with TDOT. We invited all four region staff members, headquarters, and what we found from that workshop, um, which of the recommended best practices that the staff was most interested in trying to incorporate in future public involvement efforts, was taken from more of a community approach versus technology approach. So the first one was enhanced uh, social media activities, the use of community facilitator liaison, meetings with new stakeholder groups identified in GIS community profile database, webinar formats for community meetings, and meeting at alternative times recommended for, for certain stakeholder groups. Um, with the conclusion of our research and what we find, and we're um, working on um, getting our research published um, through uh, different journals and, and presenting in the future, is that there were two key findings uh, through all our interviews, literature review, focus group, and survey, is one, awareness. There's a significant barrier to participation in the public involvement process for citizens from all demographics and regions of the state. And then two, for more meaningful and engagement to develop TDOT and also uh, other trans, uh, transportation related agencies or organizations should emphasize on two-way dialogue rather than just an input process. Fee, uh, feedback is very important to continue citizen involvement. And then overall, um, ultimately, state DOTs, and as we uh, conducted our research with TDOT, must align the best tools and approaches within the community. It's important to remember that each community is different, so, uh, so transportation planners cannot take a one-size-fits-all approach. There's no cookie-cutter approach to public participation. What works for one community may not work for the next. Therefore, it's important that TDOT and other state DOTs um, to, be a, to be more fluid and flexible when implementing their public outreach strategies. And that's all that I have. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, so we have a few minutes for questions. Um, I'm gonna pull them up now. Let's see, I think the first one that we have is for Alice. Okay, uh, first question, yeah, for Alice. What was the budget for the public involvement and what was the budget for the whole project? Um, so I should have mentioned earlier that we received a grant from an organization called the Bar Foundation specifically to do public engagement for this process. So they've contributed um, about $500,000, actually over $500,000 towards the public engagement for the process. Um, and then the city put in about that much for the transportation consulting and data work. All right, thank you. And another question for you, Alice. How long was the Visioning Lab open? Um, the Visioning Lab took place over two days. It was open from noon to 7 on a Friday, um, or maybe 11.30 to 7.30, actually. And then it was open on Saturday from 10 to 4. 
Okay, great. Um, does anyone have a good example of something they thought would work well that didn't turn out quite as planned? This is for anyone. Um, let's start maybe with Mary Beth. I think one thing that you learned was that. Oh, go ahead. Um, yeah, I mean, we did try to do some live streaming of our uh, public meetings for, um, uh, you know, the required public involvement around the plan. Um, we got some turnout there, um, but it wasn't, we probably could have done a better job letting people know they had the option of um, tuning in online, you know. Kimberly got into a lot of this in her presentation, but it's really difficult these days to get people to physically turn out for a public meeting um, unless they're just a NIMBY or they're really, really, really interested in the topic. Um, a lot of people work more than one job. They have um, children and families um, with needs, and so just letting people know that um, they have a, a way to digitally participate um, you know, I think, you know, just pr promoting that is, is I think, key to going forward in terms of letting people know that they have a voice in some of these uh, decision making. Anyone else? Um, Alice, did I hear you start to pipe in? Yeah, I was going to say that I think we, for as awesome as the truck looked, it was really, really hard, particularly at the beginning. Um, few things truly overcome Boston winters, and a lot of people would stop by, but they just, you know, there were times when people just didn't really want to talk to us. Um, and we also had a lot of plans for, you know, government celebrities, so to speak, to join us at the truck. And it seemed like every time we lined up for the mayor to be there or the commissioner, that those were the times that got snowed out and then we were never able to reschedule. I think one thing you lose is that when you do have to postpone or reschedule, you often can't get whatever that like perfect storm was that you had going for you in the first place. So um, that was something we came across. Um, I just wanted to say, this is Kimberly, um, I think one thing as our research team discovered that because of the timing of our grant and um, the funding, we were only awarded $123,000 and I know it might seem a lot, but once you have a collaborative effort from two different universities travel between uh, making presentations and, and having these groups and, and having graduate students to help us with research, that kind of sucks up a lot of your resources. But it, it would have been interesting to really try to implement these strategies within the pilot projects. I think if we had more time to actually see, um, you know, technology approach, more of a technical approach, more of a community grassroots approach to implementing these strategies within these four regions, I think it would be, it would have been uh, very re resourceful for TDOT and other agencies to see um, how well these played out um, on how these strategies to inform and engage since these are uh, four different uh, regions and not only that within these regions what we found which we we knew about them but we until we got to the the ground level was looking at it from a, re, um, a urban versus rural perspective and that's completely different so when we went into Shelbyville Tennessee and we had our focus group they mentioned that the best way to actually gain attention is basically to set up shop on the street one of the major streets have a tent and then the, the way that community engages they want to know what's going on what is that tent um, versus if it was in Nashville where people see different things go on every day you would get a lot of foot traffic if you were there right there in the community um, where uh, where citizens in that community or residents with that community would stop by just because um, you kind of stick at, you stick out like a sore thumb and people want to know what is it that's going on in their community. So I think if we just had more time to try to implement um, some of these strategies that was brought forth by the focus groups um, that I think we would have had a, a, a more in-depth um, 
analysis and conclusion when it comes to uh, public involvement efforts. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, the next question is for Alice. Um, what was the, I'm sorry, have you ever done any formal polling to determine how the public has responded to the campaign? And if so, uh, what what has the reaction been? Uh, we have not done formal polling. Um, we do use our Google and um, WordPress analytics uh, pretty extensively to understand how our web traffic is working, how our e-blasts are working, how our social media is working. Um, so we know that we've gotten 5,000 questions. We know that we were able to get 2,000 project ideas already. We know that each of our Share Your Ship stories is read by at least 200 people, maybe the same people, maybe different people. Um, there are also quite a few shares on social media for each of them. Uh, so we, we don't have a particularly quantified way of saying this percent of the population knows what Go Boston 2030 is or feels like it's responsive to their needs, but uh, we have found some pretty incredible just sort of anecdotal examples of coming across people you know, we had the trailer out and people would say, oh yeah, I heard about the truck, or I stopped by the visioning lab, or oh yeah, I kind of knew you were doing that. So I think the word of mouth is slowly spreading and then people's experiences with it. And I also recognize that I live, you know, on a personal level that I'm, my, I'm sort of in a bubble, but I'm amazed by the number of people I meet, friends of friends, or being out in events, and they say, what do you do? And I say, have you heard of Go Boston 2030? And, and they have. Um, I think in general we can also tell from the kinds of ideas and questions we've been receiving that, that we're reaching a different population than we've been reaching in previous efforts just from the proportion of people who are complaining about parking. In a traditional public meeting, a lot of longtime Boston residents come out and they demand more parking. They're really opposed to lots of new residential changes and the people that we're meeting out um, at the pop-up trailer or the question truck or who came to the lab, people who are do donating ideas online, participating in social media are all really saying, you know, how do we support people who don't have cars? How are we increasing the cost of parking? How are we making trans transit more affordable? It's a really different dialogue. So that's also a, an indicator for us that we're, we're reaching people, a new set of people. Okay, great, thank you. Um, the next question, I think this will probably be our last one. Um, how do you deal with elderly folks that might not get out and be around um, and that might not be using social media, things like Facebook and Twitter, or online type things? Um, and with that, then how do you also reach folks that might not speak English? Do you have translators that are on the street or translator services online, things like that? Um, and this is for anyone. I can say that here um, in Boston. Well, we definitely we have, advertise yeah. in. Uh, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was saying we go. advertise in. Um, minority publications. Um, we also, you know, do traditional public relations and, you know, local news, um, try and get on TV, radio, newspaper, and then, um, you know, I did a lot to um, actually do public presentations to various stakeholder groups that might have um, an inroad into community-based word-of-mouth marketing. So, like, you know, we would present the plan to our neighborhood resource center, or uh, we have a round table of African-American ministers, um, you know, various homeowners associations um, that have, you know, routine community meetings or your local uh, civic clubs, Rotary, Kiwanis, and so forth. In Boston, we've worked really closely with the Disabilities Commission, the Elderly Services Commission, and the Office of New Bostonians, which deals primarily with um, immigrant communities in Boston. The Vision Lab was translated so that everything was in English, Spanish, and Chinese. 
and um, when we're out collecting questions or collecting project ideas, everything is in English, Spanish, Chinese, Haitian Creole, Cape Verdean Creole, um, and Vietnamese. So we've that's been our, our language outreach when we were out with the street team for ideas on the street. We um, had multilingual street team members, so we had people who spoke Arabic, Spanish, Portuguese, um, and then we had Chinese translators when we were in Chinatown. In terms of reaching the elderly community or the seniors, we are working with a group, um, the people running the Age Friendly Boston Initiative. So we've taken all of our materials to senior centers with that group, with that planning initiative. And so we've been able to get feedback from seniors there. And then because we're organized, we've worked really closely with all three of those organizations in designing all of our materials from the beginning, we've also been able to you know, they're really supportive of sharing things on social media to, so to the extent that they have people following them in different languages or who are disabled or who are seniors, um, we've been able to engage them. And what was really great is that when we announced the Share Your Trip program, um, all of those different groups tweeted out. And so, you know, we had a blind man who was one of our stories because he heard about it through the Disability Commission. And we had um, the man, Victor, that I showed you heard about it through the disability, uh, the seniors, the elderly commission, and the Age Friendly Boston team. So um, we've been trying to reach people in those ways. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to add a quick note that um, in our research, we created that database, the tool database um, for transportation agencies to use um, the GIS database and basically for the senior citizens or or uh, English as a second language to work with the organizations or agencies um, within that um, uh, community and work with them to reach out to that population um, either to translate material or have a translator or also uh, to meet senior citizens within the senior citizens centers as Alice uh, mentioned earlier as well. So basically working with the community partners and agencies um, helps and we've seen that help and even in our uh, window of uh, research we've seen that to be effective as well. Okay, well, I think we're going to wrap up for the day. Uh, Alice Brown, Kimberly Triplett, and Mary Beth Eichert, thank you for joining us. Um, and thank you for, to the Transportation Planning Division uh, for sponsoring today's webcast. And I uh, hope everyone has a, a, a great Wednesday, and, and hopefully we'll um, hear from all of you on uh, Friday. Thanks, everyone, and have a great day.